Okay, open source stage, last talk of the day. Frost Snap self custody design for million dollar Bitcoin. Hello. All right, this is an important one, so get ready for it. So, Bitcoin self custody needs to change. Bitcoin self custody has changed many times in its history, and it's actually time for it to change once again. Before we get into the next change for self custody, let's take a look back in history at some of the significant changes that Bitcoin self custody has had in the past. In the early days of Bitcoin, of the bootstrapping the Bitcoin network, it was fine to store your Bitcoin on an internet connected node. It was fine at the time because Bitcoin was relatively worthless. There was no need to protect it, no need to back it up, no need to take much care in storing it because it didn't really have any value. But as Bitcoin's value increased and as its importance as money grew, the demands of users also grew. There became a trend of making Bitcoin paper wallets. These paper wallets provided a means of backing up an individual private key on pieces of paper. You would go into a website and generate a Bitcoin private key and a corresponding address. These paper wallets were really awesome because you could just deposit money onto them and then hand them out as sort of gifts to friends and get them into Bitcoin. However, these paper wallets had many, many problems. Uh, they were often lost, damaged, or destroyed. The generator websites of paper wallets were often uh, malicious or were even sometimes hijacked so that uh, you know, they would, the, the website would give you a private key that isn't secure and someone could steal your money. And so over time, as the value of Bitcoin grew, the, it became too valuable to store on paper. And once again, Bitcoin self-custody had to change. In 2013, Bitcoin users began using, using hierarchical deterministic wallets. And all this means is that from one master private key, you can derive a whole series of other private keys and addresses. So instead of using the same address every time, you now had a full wallet that you could use different addresses for different recipients with much better privacy. Wallets like Electrum and Armory had this address derivation, which is a big improvement for self-custody. And they also added seed phrase backups, which I'm sure many of you use today to back up your Bitcoin. But these software wallets that were very popular at the time were on internet connected devices. And they became frequent targets of malware as the value of Bitcoin increased. Users required stronger security than an internet connected computer. And so while also retaining the ability to easily spend, kind of like how paper wallets you could easily just hand around to a friend. Bitcoin had to move off internet connected devices. And again, Bitcoin self custody had to change. In 2013, Trezor came out with the first Bitcoin specific signing device. You would plug the Trezor into your computer and you could generate a, a Bitcoin wallet on the device and it it protects your keys inside the device, isolating it from the internet. People took this a step further, and it's been a big design principle in the last few years of taking this even further. So not only having a uh, signing device that uh, isn't connected to the internet, but even not even plugging that signing device into an internet-connected internet device, just plugging it into power and using SD cards or QR codes to ferry transactions. Many hardware wallets focus on this as a design principle for their security. There are now many hardware wallets. And with the security of the device often being a focus, pins and secure elements, and common practices of PSPT signing, even these stateless signing devices, which don't protect the private key at all, is a very uh, different design approach. Today. It is not uncommon for Bitcoiners to store their entire life savings in Bitcoin. I'm sure there's many people in the audience in this conference who store all their money in Bitcoin, probably on a single hardware wallet. 
as Bitcoin's value increases, we, have, we face new attacks and new challenges as users. The sophistication of attacks on Bitcoiners is increasing. One thing I would like you to take away is you should not be able to spend your life savings in a matter of minutes. Many self-custody setups are vulnerable to attacks of coercion. Someone you know, points a knife or a gun at you, tells you to unlock your hardware wallet, you're probably going to do it. You're probably going to lose your life savings in a matter of minutes. The design principles of air gapping are no longer the design principles we need for the appropriate tool for these security risks. Uh, just to point out uh, one from home in Sydney, Australia, uh, Someone who worked at our equivalent, I think it's your DMV, like your automobile association, you know, gives license places out. Uh, someone who worked at our equivalent of, of that um, leaked someone's address to these kidnappers. These kidnappers went to his house, pulled his teeth out for like six days trying to get uh, all his cryptocurrency. Uh, I don't know if he was successful. Um, as the value of Bitcoin grows, we need to move to new design principles that are going to protect us from these more and more sophisticated attacks. The way forward is multi-signature. By protecting your wallet behind multiple keys, you can spread the risk across multiple devices and you can put these devices in different places or with different people that you trust. Multi-signature down, slows down the spending process. By having your keys distributed, it prevents someone from going to you and trying to force your Bitcoin, you to give that your Bitcoin to them. Because you have to tell them, oh, if you want my Bitcoin, I can sign on this key, but you're gonna have to take me to this place or this person, you know, maybe an hour or could have been the other side of the country in order to get access to your coins. Sovereign uh, multisig also provides sovereign protection from yourself. Uh, you know, if you, you might have some stupid idea that you want to buy this, like, you know, this Taproot Wizard uh, ordinal inscription thing, and maybe you think that, oh, you know, instead of being able to buy it right away for however many Bitcoin, what you could do is now you've got multisig, you've got, you know, 20 minutes, an hour, a few days even, to think about the silly decision you're making. We have multisig today in Bitcoin, uh, but it has a lot of problems. And so some of the problems here, it's quite complex to set up. I don't know if any of you have tried to set up a multisig, but it's a little bit scary. Uh, the first time I tried it, I had no idea what was going on. Um, and it takes a very long time to understand. Multisig today has very quite risky backups. Uh, so if you make a two out of three multi-sig where you have three keys and you need any two of the keys to sign, there's an unintuitive foot gun with multi-sig today that you, even if you have two private keys, you actually need to have awareness of all three public keys uh, of your wallet, usually in the form of a descriptor file um, that you, you back up. It could be even a QR code. But this unintuitive foot gun has led to many people losing their money in the past. Multisig today, you also pay much higher fees. Because the transaction scripts are much bigger than just a single signature tr transaction, uh, for, for example, a two out of three, you end up paying about twice as much in fees as you would as a regular wallet. If you make a five of eight or you know, a 10 of 20, you're gonna be seriously hurting in the amount of fees you pay. With Multisig today, you also have really bad privacy. Because you have this uh, script that you put publish on chain, when you spend from your wallet, everyone can go into the Bitcoin blockchain and can see, oh, that came from a two of three multi-sig, or that came from a three of five multi-sig. It not only makes it easier to link the transactions, the, your transactions together, but it also presents some risk of security that people know, oh, you know, the person who's paid me has a two out of three, so I need to compromise two keys in order to sp sp steal their Bitcoin. Multisig today also leaves a lot to be desired uh, in terms of inheritance planning for your Bitcoin. So, what is the next big change in self-custody? It seems like multisig is the way. Frostsnap is building the next big change in self-custody with next-generation multisig using Taproot. Here, 
are our prototype multi-sig devices. They plug into each other seamlessly in a daisy chain. They're powered by Taproot, and they make multi-sig very, very, very easy. After this talk, I'll uh, park myself on one of these tables if you want to see uh, an early demo. The latest cryptography that we're using actually avoids all the problems of multi-sig today. You don't pay any higher fees. You don't have any worsened privacy. Inheritance can be quite easy, as I'll show in a moment. Um, and your security is very good. Frostnap is built with Frost, taproot threshold signatures. And something we're really excited about with Frost is the ability to create flexible and sovereign access rules or access policies to your Bitcoin. What this means is you can easily define your security in a way that makes sense for you. And not only can you define it in, with certain rules, but you can actually adapt and change these rules as your situation changes. With FrostSnap, you can geographically distribute your devices around the world or with people you trust. FrostSnap makes, to look, makes uh, inheritance very easy. Uh, so in this example, imagine you made a two of three multi-sig with three FrostSnap devices. What you can actually do is take two of those devices, get a few more FrostSnap devices, and actually daisy chain them. And what we're going to do is we can actually create a second multi-sig that accesses the same wallet. So here, we've got our, our two devices from our two of three up the top. And we just plug in three more devices, and we can make a three of three. And we can share these devices amongst your partner, maybe a family member, and your lawyer, or whoever is appropriate for your circumstance. This makes inheritance very easy. This, this additional access structure to your multi-sig accesses the same wallet, the same funds, so it makes inheritance dead simple. You just make another multi-sig that accesses your wallet in your absence. Alternatively, something else cool you can do is uh, you can actually, with FrostSnap, it's possible, we haven't built it yet, but it will be possible, to actually take your two of three, you can just plug them all in together, and you can actually use those devices to generate a new key, a fourth key, and you can share that with a collaborative custodian, a trusted a third party who's going to hold on to that key for you as a service. With FrostSnap, we also envision spending access policies. So like I said before, you shouldn't be able to uh, use your life savings in a matter of minutes. So with FrostSnap, you can have your, uh, your two of three, your master access policy, and because the devices are tightly integrated with the phone, what we can actually do is create additional spending policies. And what this would look like is each between each device and the phone, we create another multi-sig, a two of two. So a multi-sig between the phone and device A, another multi-sig between the phone and device B, another one between the phone and device C. Access is the same wallet, and we can enforce software-defined spending limits that you could say, I only want to be able to spend up to a million sats per day with just one device. So what this means is, if you want to spend up to a million sats per day, you only just have to sign on one device. It's still convenient, still easy. You can carry one around with you. But if you want to spend, you know, you want to buy a car or someone's trying to rob you, well, they're going to have to get multiple of your keys to sign which you can leave in faraway places or with different people. So FrostNap is building the ultimate self-custody tool. We envision these access policies allowing you to customize your setup in a way that suits you. You have your cold storage or your policy authorship policy. You have a spending policy for convenient spending. And you can have your inheritance all of these wallets accessing, all of these pathways accessing the same Bitcoin. So the next big change in self-custody is coming with FrostSnap. 
This is what we need as Bitcoin's value increases and as Bitcoin's appreciation in money improves. I'm very proud to be announcing today Frostnap Founders Edition will be coming later this year. A pack of three powerful devices providing easy multi-sig powered by Taproot and many updates to follow. People on our mailing list on frostnap.com uh, will be the first to hear about our, our Founders Edition. So I highly re recommend you just put an email or an email alias into there. You can also follow us along at Frostnap Tech on Twitter or X and uh, make sure to get in on our Frostnap Founders Editions. Uh, thanks very much to my team, Adam and Lloyd, who unfortunately are busy working. Um, and get ready for the next change in self-custody. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I could probably take a few. I think people often have a lot of questions about Frost and next-gen multisig. Uh, so feel free. I know you can just shout them out or... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question was, how would the inheritance, uh, how does that compare to these collaborative custodians today? Um, so one is that you can make, one thing is when you're joining these collaborative custodians today, you have to make a brand new multisig with them. You can't uh, enroll them at a later date. So you can't, if, if you have a multisig already and you want to get onto one of these collaborative custodians to hold a key, you actually just have to make a whole new multisig and, and include them in that. Um, with this latest cryptography, we can actually just add them in or even remove them out at will. Uh, so it's very sovereign and very flexible and it'll save you on fees, save you on privacy um, and just make your life a whole lot easier. Yeah, thanks for the question. So there's no wallet file backup because you have it all on the devices, is that? Uh, uh, no backup or? Yeah. Um, we're going to make backups just for like comfort. Uh, so each device will have its own backup. Mm -hmm. um, you only need a threshold, like two out of the three of those backups, and you're sweet. So you're removing the foot gun of if you lose a device and it's backup and you don't have that public key. Exactly, so, okay. exactly. So yeah, fortunately uh, with Frost, you because uh, the multi-sig is actually, um, it's not done in Bitcoin script, so you don't need to remember, you don't need to write down these public keys so you can recreate the script at a later date. All you need is like two out of the three shares and you can, rec you can sign using that, that uh, private key. We also had a question, what booth are you at? Uh, unfortunately, no booth yet, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up on one of these tables just for a few minutes. Uh, I wish we had a booth, maybe next year, yeah. Once we start selling some devices. So it takes in information. I was just wondering if you could do an attack in the middle type of thing where it Kind of has it. Oh, is the question that uh, would the top device uh, be able to pretend to be the other three? Was it? Yeah. Um, great question. Really good question. Uh, so, during the key generation, the wallet creation, each device uh, contributes randomness to the key. So each device like makes some random numbers, puts it inside the. Um, they all join them together in a special way that's actually verifiable. And so at the end of key generation, what you get is like a, a string of, you know, uh, at the moment it's hex, but I want to make it emojis. So it's like really, you know, nice to look at. And all you have to do is on each device, compare that the emojis match. If the emojis match, you can be certain that no device is lying or being malicious or pretending to be the other ones. Every device is verifiably uh, participated in the key creation. Any more questions? A few more? Here you go, sir. He's got a mic for you. And Thanks. The um, in that random number generator, how do I trust your random number? Yep. Uh, we're on the open source stage, so it's all open source code. Um, we, 
the, the key generation is open source. You'll be able to verify the firmware or even build the firmware yourself. Um, and is there no secure enclave? No, uh, not yet. We're, we're thinking about it, um, but actually, I don't think we need it. Uh, and the reason for it, there's a few reasons for this. Um, the secure enclaves on devices today, all they do is uh, protect the private key behind like a pin. And we really don't like pins. We don't want, like, we, pe people forget pins. You have to do these like pin reminders all the time to make sure people don't lose them. Um, we want to move away from this securing the device itself to going to this distributed security among a, a bunch of devices. Um, we, we do have some ideas for how we can uh, maybe do something better than a secure element by using the, the phone itself. Um, we, could, we could actually encrypt the secret share on each device and on the phone have a decryption key. So you need to unlock your phone for the device to actually be useful. Do each of the individual devices have their own uh, uh, backup seed phrase? Uh, each one has their own backup. At the moment, we're exploring uh, alternative formats to seed phrases. Um, there's a few reasons for this. Uh, it, seed phrases are actually quite long. Like, if you need to put a bit of data in there, you know, tw it'll be like 24 words. 24 words for three devices is a bit annoying. Um, we can actually use something called like BEC32. M, which is what uh, uh, Taproot addresses. That's like this, this uh, encoding. There's like 32 characters. Um, we're looking at using this because it actually is really good error correction. If you like, if you, you know, delete, if you mess up one of the characters, the backup will still work fine. Um, with seed words, if you mess up a word, you have to like brute force all the other words until you get the right one. Uh, so yeah, back 32 m has some like, uh, some some better redundancy, and we think it might be an interesting choice that no one's really tried before. Any other questions? Any more questions? Frost, uh, next gen multi sig. No. All right, let's call it. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>